few years ago, I was invited to join an expedition to Greenland, the Cape Farewell Art Science Expedition in 2008. Cape Farewell is a project that was founded back in 2001. At that time, uh, it was principally scientists who were communicating the climate change issue, and, and uh, perhaps they weren't doing it sufficiently well in order to really engage people uh, in the fight against climate change. And the founder of Cape Farewell thought, it's artists who are amongst the most creative communicators in, in society, and maybe artists have something to contribute to the big effort to communicate this issue in a way that's really going to resonate with people. So he started this series of expeditions. Uh, each year he would convene a group of artists and scientists and take them on these uh, wonderful journeys. And the idea was that they would learn from each other. The artists especially would learn more about climate change and hopefully become inspired to engage uh, on climate change through their creative work. And so in 2008 there was a, a journey to, wet to East, West Greenland, sorry, and I was lucky enough to be invited to join. Uh, when we got to Greenland, the first thing we were struck by, of course, was, was the natural beauty. This is uh, part of the, the, the western coastline of Greenland and the southwestern portion of the country. As we moved north, the coastline changed. This is the icy west coast, the boat we were on. There's beautiful wildlife uh, that we saw along the way, beautiful people. This is our Greenlandic Inuit guide, Karen. Um, there were lots of very colorful communities that dotted the coast uh, and at first glance they looked quite exotic with the colorful little houses, but they were remarkably familiar with playgrounds and soccer fields. Uh, each night northern lights dazzled in the sky. One of the evenings looking out off the back of the boat, the northern lights were in the sky. In the water there was bioluminescent plankton that glowed blue. One of the artists brought a powerful red light and captured these images of icebergs at night. We learned a little bit of history when we were in Greenland. In the 1700s, there was a Lutheran missionary from Norway that came to Greenland uh, to promote the Lutheran faith. And one of the pieces of the Lutheran faith is the Lord's Prayer. Many of you will know it. Part of the prayer is, is give us this day our daily bread. In Greenland in the 1700s, there was no bread. There wasn't even the word bread in the Greenlandic diet. And so the missionary changed the word bread with seal, which was uh, a staple for people in Greenland. One of the artists on the trip, Mojisola, wrote a poem. She called it the Greenlandic Prayer. Uh, there was another artist on the trip named Francis Francesca Galeazzi from Italy. She turned out to be the, the provocatrice on the trip, the, provo the most provocative person. She brought with her a six kilogram cylinder of CO2 and she released it all into the air. And she said, you must think I'm an evil woman, but I'm not. I've done nothing wrong. You see, I've offset these emissions using a gold standard certified carbon offsetting scheme. Isn't that great? I can go about consciously polluting the atmosphere, wasting energy, and abusing our natural resources, and I just have to pay somebody else to compensate for my bad actions, and I can be carbon neutral. Isn't that great? This is me in the blue coat. I was asked, uh, with, along with somebody else, to perform in a play that was written by uh, a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright who was with us named Susan Laurie Parks. Uh, there were no lines, fortunately. We had only to, to walk this route wedged between a glacier on one side and the ocean uh, on the other. It was called a forever play. The idea was that we had been walking forever and we had forever to go. And the only way we would ever get there was together. And so we took turns carrying each other, helping each other along the way. 
Uh, Marcus Brigstock, he was um, a, a special Cape Farewell participant. This was actually his second time on the Cape Farewell trip. He had been there the year before and, and um, in 2000, and I guess that would have been 2007. So after he returned from the 2007 expedition to London where he's from, uh, he encountered something that was released on Channel 10 in London or in the UK called The Great Global Warming Swindle which was a, a made-for-TV documentary that asserted that uh, climate change was a lie and the greatest scam of modern times. And um, Marcus responded to that uh, the way that Marcus often responds to things, like so. China's not doing it, so neither am I. Miss, miss, Johnny's not doing his sums. Miss, so neither am I. Grow up. There's lots that China isn't doing that's worth our while. Democracy, human rights, eating cheddar, to name but three. If your excuse for behaving like a selfish, backward, arrogant twonk is China, then please, buy a house by the sea and stay in it when the water comes up over your head. That's what Dominic gets for not including the question mark in the title of my talk. <laughs> uh, Marcus and I actually, we spent a fair bit of time together on the trip, partly because he was uh, very, very funny, but partly also we spent a lot of time together with this woman. Her name is Tracy Rowledge. Um, Tracy's a bookbinder. And at first, uh, neither Marcus nor I knew what bookbinders were or what they did. As it turns out, uh, it's exactly as it sounds. Tracy makes bindings for books. And, and typically, Tracy works with uh, very valuable and historic texts that need a new binding. And, and her craft is to create a binding that somehow matches with and enhances uh, the text. And always it's in that order. The text comes first, and Tracy would, would build a binding to match. And we got to talking about what if you changed that order and instead of starting with a book and building a binding to match, you started with the binding first. And what if we built this binding that was so magnificent that the only thing that could ever belong in it was the answer uh, to one of the world's great problems, like climate change or a global AIDS pandemic or whatever the case might have been. And we got to thinking, what if we created this magnificent binding and we offered it as a gift to the presidents and the prime ministers that were supposed to meet uh, that year in Copenhagen or at any of the meetings subsequently uh, and, and, and finally agree to some way that we could all work together uh, uh, to solve this issue. And it became this really powerful idea. And then we thought, what if instead of offering it as a gift for the presidents and the prime ministers, what if we offered it as a gift to people 50 years down the road? And over the next 50 years, we would write the history of how it is that our generation uh, found the courage and the commitment to really make the big changes that we know we need to make. So this is a wonderful idea. There was another person on the trip with us, an academic named Joe Smith. Joe was, he's from Cambridge, and he was involved in a project <coughs> called the Cambridge 100 Questions Project. And the idea with this project was to bring together a whole, bunch of, a whole bunch of thought leaders from all over the world, Nobel laureates and others. And together they would identify the 100 questions that most desperately needed to be answered if humanity is to continue to thrive. Huge task. And they wanted, the project team wanted some kind of a symbol or an artifact, uh, an icon for this project. And Joe was familiar with with our idea about the binding. And so he commissioned Tracy to put together something to represent the project. And Tracy got to thinking about it and she thought, you know, it's often seated at a desk that humans do our best thinking. And so Tracy teamed up with a cabinet maker and together they built this this beautiful wooden desk and, and I didn't tell you, Tracy does all of her bindings out of leather. This is Tracy's leather work and often she does gold tooling. And there's that, that, uh, the desk surface is a leather bound gold tooled surface. Really beautiful and then along the length of the desk are these little spaces, these cabinet spaces, where all of the participants' submissions could be profiled. I want to show you just a single 
of these. This is from uh, another Canadian, a guy named John Polanyi, who was a Nobel Prize winning chemist. He submitted that some seven billion of us share this crowded planet. The question is whether we can achieve a sufficient sense of com community to continue doing so. We'll skip to the bottom. Is our species capable of the necessary generosity of spirit? Uh, perhaps the most pressing question that humanity faces today, uh, certainly uh, the, the subject of a conversation uh, worth having. Oh. Does anyone else want to perform? <laughs> it's not a performance. <laughs> Coffee. All right, it's coffee time. So here's the. Uh, Sorry, can you repeat where you were in the, those uh, pictures? Uh, in Greenland. In Greenland. Okay. Any other questions for David? And this this trip goes to different places every year. Or is it always Greenland? Uh, different places. Different places. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they've started to change a little bit. They're doing. Uh, I think last year they did an urban expedition in Toronto, perhaps. Mm. They they did a South American one. Uh, up until the time that I was on the trip, they were all Arctic expeditions. Wonderful. Why, why Greenland? Were you saying we're showing the beauty of the nature, or, or because, the, because the glaciers are um, Prior to the Greenland trip, there had been two trips, I think, to East Greenland. There had been a trip to Spitsbergen, uh, I think perhaps elsewhere. Um, they rotated, they, they went from place to place, uh, to places that were both inspirational, I think. Oh, actually, there's a, yes, so three things. Uh, interesting places where you might see something that looks something like climate change. We also had two science teams on the trip who were doing, they were both, uh, one team was headed by a, a, an oceanographer from a British university. There was a group from the British Antarctic Survey, I think, as well. So there were two s real science teams doing real science work while we were there as well. So they might have had some kind of input to the process as well, or to the, the location choice. Just, like, I, yeah, I don't really get the point of the artists. Pardon me? I don't really get the point of the artists on this trip. I wonder, like, like yeah, is taking a picture of beautiful nature, does that bring people to think about Let's conserve a beautiful nature. Is that the, the outcome? Uh, 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 artists have different way of communicating. So I can tell you I've, I've done presentations like this quite a number of times. Uh, and some people get this and some people don't. Um, the poem, for example, is something that uh, quite a number of people have been absolutely touched by. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and thinking back um, thinking about kind of the institutionalist perspective that I talked about yesterday, uh, if you're a person of faith, then the Lord's Prayer means something to you quite a lot, you know, and if, if you grew up in a Christian tradition, you might have um, uh, been encouraged to repeat the Lord's Prayer every Sunday or, or even every day of the week for your whole life, right? And, and so the thing that, the reason I think that was very powerful for some people and I'm thinking of one person in particular who asked if I could, if they could have it and share it, who was a Jesuit priest. Uh, you know, there's something structurally familiar about that poem, right? As soon as you get in, as soon as your head and your heart is in that structure, um, you're, you're, you're captured by it. Uh, and, and you have these, you're replacing the words with some other words, deliver us from petrol. Uh, but you're still in that same kind of, you're in that um, faith-based space. There's a whole bunch of other embedded meaning there. There's, um, uh, I mean, central to all of the faith traditions is a commitment to, to stewardship of, or creation, uh, stewardship of creation. So you're in that space. And we're starting to associate, um, through this poem, for example, we're associating stewardship of creation with delivering us from petrol. Uh, so interesting idea. Um, and, and that's not for everybody, uh, but it is for some people. The idea, the, the 
you know, two people walking together, we've come from forever and we're going to forever, the only way we're ever going to get, I mean, that's sort of symbolic of the task that we have, isn't it? Uh, the fight against climate change is probably never going to end, right? It's a journey and the only way we're ever going to succeed uh, along the way is if we work together. Nice idea. Um, and and I, I think, you know, I, I could sit here and offer that to you in a, you know, the way I did yesterday and just sit here and be a, one of these and you can listen or not. Um, and, and it may have some impact or not. Uh, this is just another way of, of communicating those ideas uh, and probably a way that will be received or interpreted differently, um, hopefully better by people that me sitting there and offering that idea in a, you know, more usual um, format won't. You know, for me, it wasn't, it's this last question, do we, is the species even capable of the necessary generosity of spirit? You know, that's, it's a question that's very, it's a great way of framing it, mm -hmm. expressing it, but how is this being disseminated and kind of the like, PR efforts behind it? Because I think if it took place, people should know about it. Uh, I haven't had any involvement with the, that project in particular, the 100 Questions project. I assume that they've been... Like the, the trip. Oh, um, Cape Farewell has its own program of education and outreach. They do... Um, they've, they've had a long-standing partnership with the Eden Project in the UK. Mm -hmm. And so I think they have quite a presence in the UK. They've had a number of traveling exhibitions. I know in Chicago, they had an exhibition in Chicago. Some, some, it lasted about two months, uh, I think, and they had a number of public events. Um, they've tried to get this out through the cultural sector, museums, etc. Uh, I think they've developed some, some educational curriculum, which is delivered through schools, partnerships through universities. I don't know how widespread that, how big that effort is. Um, in Canada, I've never, well in Canada, uh, they had a partnership with the British Council in Canada um, and there was a Cape Farewell Canada project for young people, uh, which was kind of similarly inspired, a little bit different. So they've had a number of partnerships and they've gotten the word out uh, far and wide. Um, a number of the musicians, so on the particular trip, the, the trip that I went on was the, the largest of all of the trips, there were about 40 artists, and half of those were musicians. Um, some of the musicians, uh, Jarvis Cocker was on the trip, Katie Tunstall was on the trip, uh, Leslie Feist was on the trip, and I, I mentioned those three because all of them wrote songs subsequently that, you know, they're not talking about the ice melting in Greenland, but one of them was named Slush, uh, one of them was named um, Umanak, which is one of the communities we visited, and, and there were references to those. Um, I remember when I learned about Slush, Jarvis Cocker was performing at Glastonbury, I think, and he gave a little preamble to his performance at Glastonbury. He had 300,000 people or 500,000 people, and he gave a bit of a story on uh, having gone to the Arctic and, and seeing, you know, the Arctic melting and, and a bay full of slush. So, you know, that's a very, it's a huge audience that, that sadly uh, and probably fortunately I'm never going to have, right? And, <laughs> and, and so, you know, his 30 seconds uh, talking about slush and melting ice is going to reach far more people and, and, you know, there isn't maybe as much depth as me sitting here and talking about how we need to, you know, fundamentally transform uh, all of the institutions that shape our lives. But, you know, it's part of, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's, I talked yesterday, yesterday about how big this challenge is, how we all from across the whole of society need to push in all the different ways that we can. And that includes some of the, you know, the cultural entrepreneurs, the people who are shaping uh, us through culture have a role to play. I think that's the idea. Um, hmm. All right. Thanks very much, David. Uh,